Hey, Jess here to share another throwback episode with you. While I prepare some exciting new episodes to be released, you're going to love my upcoming guests. This week, I wanted to share with you the most downloaded episode to date. Now, I can imagine why this episode is so popular, because it's all about food. Food and kids. And who doesn't need help with that stressor? The fabulous Jennifer Anderson from Kids Eat in Color is a wealth of information. She's a mom of two and a registered dietitian nutritionist, and she speaks to moms who are dealing with starting solids or with picky toddlers. On this episode, you'll learn how to take control back over mealtime, how to lower your stress, and she also answers a few listener questions. I know that you will gain some insight with this one. Jennifer is gold. So here she is. Did you always want to be a nutritionist? How did that kind of come about? No, I I had never even thought of it until I I went to college. I studied cultural anthropology and I graduated and I wanted to do some like community work. I wanted to do something that felt meaningful to me and I I found a job as a youth nutrition program coordinator at a food bank. And I started you know, working with programs and starting programs in low resource schools and communities. And I just saw the impact of nutrition and food access on kids from a very early age. And I decided that, um, actually I, I got married during that time and my husband was like, you should go back and get a master's degree. And I was like, eh, I don't know. That's, <laughs> I don't know if I really want to do that. He's like, no, really. And he, he talked me into it and I'm glad he did because it was something that was good for me, but it really, at that time, it took somebody else. I didn't know anybody with a master's degree. Mm-hmm. So it was really outside of even my, uh, my, myself, like, what does that even mean? And so I went back and I studied nutrition and I didn't realize you need, I needed a lot of prerequisites for that. So I went back to school for three years and, you know, undergrad classes of chemistry and biology. And I, uh, that's when I got my master's in science and public health and then became a registered dietitian after that. Wow. So I took the long route, the six yeah. year route plus bachelor's, you know, it was like 10 years of school. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like you've got a lot of knowledge in there. So that's, yeah. that's the most important. Mm-hmm. So that kind of ties into my next question, which is what did life look like before you became a mom? So you weren't doing, were you just starting the nutritionist stuff? What were you working on? Yeah, actually, right. So I had just finished school and we were trying to get pregnant, which took a lot longer. And that's a whole (laughs) other story um, than I was anticipating. But uh, I was looking for a job pregnant. And um, there, so there actually wasn't a lot of time that I was working and uh, did not have children in one way or another. So, um, Yeah. So I went to go look for a job and I had a really hard time and I eventually found a job doing like communications and information management for the USDA. I I was a contractor and I coordinated information for their, um, their, uh, national SNAP ed program. So um, it's kind of complicated what I did, but to put it softly, I support, to put it simply, I, I supported the program that did national education for people who receive SNAP okay. or food okay. stamps. Got it. So I did that for seven years. And during that time, I also started Kids Eat in Color. My own son fell off the growth chart when he was very young or started to, that took a, took a while Uh, And I learned that feeding kids is really difficult. It's not at all the easy thing that like pictures of moms feeding kids broccoli looks like. (laughs) And I, I, when my son was three and I was making these cute little preschool lunches just to get him to eat, I thought, you know what? I cannot be the only mom in this problem. And that's where Kids Eating Color came from. Well, you answered my next question. That's awesome. (laughs) <laughs> what were the beginning steps of that? Did you just kind of play and test or did you, were you coming from your nutritionist background and did that have any research in kids eating or did you just kind of learn it as you went as a mom? Yeah, I really, I mean, you know, I had some training in feeding kids and parent feeding styles and what has the best in- outcomes for feeding kids. I got that stuff as part of my registered dietitian training and my master's training. But there is a pretty big difference between 
learning about that in a class and looking at your own <laughs> child and being like, yeah. oh my gosh, there's just so many other factors there. So it was a lot of research on my own, a lot of trial and error, a lot of, okay, how do I systematize this? How do I actually make this part of my life so that it works? And it, you know, it was really good that I went through that with my first son because it turns out my second son was actually a much more selective eater. Mm. And while my first son doesn't I mean, eating is just not his jam. He would rather be doing anything else, right? <laughs> but my second son is more like, I don't like it. I don't like it. And I'm going to require like 500 exposures to tomato before I'll decide yeah. that I'll eat it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And and so as far as like kids eating color went, it that was really more like, you know, I just have this feeling I need to help some other moms. Yeah. And I started by just posting pictures of my kids' lunches. That was it for a long time. So I want to go back to when your sons are babies. When they're babies, they're just starting out with food. In my mind, and I mm-hmm. am prefacing this by reminding everybody that I'm a mama in training. I'm not a mama yet. <laughs> so I don't really know what it's like, but I've done a lot of babysitting and I've seen what different moms have done. Yeah. I remember this one story where I was babysitting this little kid and the mom came back oh. from doing some errands And she started helping with the lunch. She just kept giving her, in that one sitting, she must have given her 20 options, like 20 different things. And this little baby, I mean, I think she was... She was over one. It's it's really the job of the parent to decide what kids are served. Mm -hmm. And here's the problem. And, you know, I think before you have kids, maybe you have this ideal, your kid is never going to eat junk food. They're never going to eat sugar. I mean, you name it. We have all sorts of ideas before we have the children. And then they come and you're like, ah, this is working out the way I thought it would be. Um, here's, Here's what we see. And this often hits right around one to two is babies are growing. They're eating a ton of food, maybe. Maybe they don't eat that much, but they, they feel like they're eating a lot. And then all of a sudden they hit one and they eat almost nothing. And you as the mom, this is, and the reason I wear the, the reuse the word yeah. mom is because it's almost always the mom who freaks out. Yeah. Freaks out. Like in a real way, like, oh my gosh, my child is starving. This is not a fabricated fear. This is not something... I mean, for all this, like the previous six months yeah. or the previous year, and they were eating every two to three hours you, or whatnot. Yeah, so. you are you are the sole nurturing source. Whether you're feeding formula or breastfeeding, you are like, uh, you're the source. Like it's your job, and this is, and then all of a sudden your child stops eating, and you flip out, yeah. and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm a terrible parent, and my kid is in danger, and that's what you're. you're it just takes over your mind, and it it can become an obsessive thought, Mm -hmm. right? It's like front and center. Here's what moms don't realize. Kids at one stop growing very much at all. They grow a couple inches. Babies triple their size in one year, which is remarkable. Imagine how much energy that must take to triple your size in one year. Toddlers, on the other hand, grow a couple inches. It's like, how much food do they need for that? Not very much. And that's where so many moms fall into this trap of like, oh my gosh, they didn't eat that. I just have to give them anything that they'll eat to get over this hump so that they'll continue to grow. What they don't realize is a one-year-old might eat three bites of food in one day and that's totally normal and okay. Oh my gosh, that's awesome to hear. Now the next day, they literally may eat as much as you and then the mom is like, what? Now, now they're eating too much. So what we really have to do is step back with, with that one to two age and say, hey, I don't know how much my kid is going to eat, but it's going to be okay. And I'm going to continue to do my doctor's appointments like normal. And they're going to tell me if my child is growing properly. I'm not going to try to assume that my child may be large. My child may be small. My child may be fat. My child may be skinny. My child may be any size that exists, but that actually doesn't actually correlate that well to what they're eating. Right, right. So the doctor is the pediatrician is the one who's really going to be able to say, okay, I've been tracking their growth. And, you know, like when you look at that growth chart, there are children all along that growth chart and your child may go a little up, go a little down, but they're generally going to follow a curve that's right for them. That may be third percentile and that may be 
90th percentile, both are okay. And so if we're like hyper-focused on their eating, then we're hyper-focused on like how much they're eating. We're hyper-focused on the wrong thing. Instead, we should be hyper-focused on what's available to them, what we're serving. We don't need to serve 20 options. You know, serving two to three, maybe four options is perfectly fine for for meals and snacks. You know, maybe if you're like super foodie and you like to have 10 options at a meal and that's just what your family does, okay, that's fine too. But but if it's just for the action of getting the baby to eat something, yeah, it's totally unnecessary. Yeah, okay, that's so good to hear. No, it doesn't mean that your child is not going to become picky. Yeah, of course. Many children become picky regardless of what you feed them. You know, there's this idea out there that if I do baby led weaning, which is a newer form of newer and older form of feeding, um, my child won't become picky. And that's just not true. It may decrease the risk of them becoming picky. So for some kids, they won't become picky because they did baby led weaning, but many kids will still show selective behaviors and they'll still become picky eaters, regardless of what kind of weaning was done for them. And it's our job to then take stock of what our child is choosing to eat when they're not and always making sure they have a safe food at a meal but we don't need to cater to them beyond that. Yeah. That leads me into a question that I had from a mom that was sent in, which is exactly what you said. Do you encourage baby led weaning purees or do you advocate for whatever works for the mama? And how did you handle it with your boys? I always say, I call my weaning method, whatever you want weaning, (laughs) because as a mom who had depression and anxiety, I could not so I, I was treated very poorly by some moms who were very excited about baby led weaning. And I, because of that, I'm always very sensitive to the fact that people who do baby led weaning think they are doing something. I, I, I don't, this sounds like I'm making a stereotype of all people. Often the way that baby led weaning is presented, even in the books, and I've read some of the books, is if you do this, your kid won't be picky. That's not accurate. That's not what the science says. There are downsides to baby led weaning, just like there are downsides to purees. What's the most important is what I just described, which is you're the parent, you're in charge of what your child is fed. You need to teach them to eat. And that's the strength of baby led weaning is that you're allowing your kid to get messy. You're allowing your kid to experience different textures and different Mm -hmm. foods and different flavors. You know what? You can do all of that while also using purees. So I did literally whatever was easiest. And you know what? The tool that I think I would pay a million dollars for, but really it's like 15, (laughs) it's a baby food grinder. When you have made a meal for the rest of your family, because guess what? You have to eat too. And you're not going to eat food out of a baby food jar. Um, And frankly, the stuff out of a baby food jar, I don't want to knock it, but also it tastes really gross. So I could... Personally, I just couldn't really feed that to my kids because I was like, this is disgusting. I don't (laughs) want it in my mouth and I don't want it. (laughs) But other babies are like totally into it. So there's there's nothing wrong with it. But for me, it wasn't a good fit just for me. So I made some purees. My kids were extremely independent eaters. And the very first time at six months old when I fed my first child uh, some mashed banana mixed with breast milk like with a spoon, you know, it's like Mm. nothing fancy. He grabbed the spoon, shoved it in his own mouth and insisted he feed himself basically from then on. (laughs) Wow. So he really, he really weaned himself. And I just like, I would thicken pureed food with like, you know, fortified cereal. And I would uh, use the baby for grinder because I'm not going to make a separate meal for the baby every night. That was way too much for me. The best I could do was to make dinner for a family and then stick in a baby food grinder with some liquid and grind it up at the table. Yeah. And then he basically got just what we had. And there was other times where I gave him age appropriate food, like a piece of avocado. Oh my gosh. The time that I gave him a piece of avocado and he realized that he could feed himself chunks of food. That was really it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like the end of purees. (laughs) And I don't know when that happened. That was maybe like seven months, but I mean, the kid was extremely independent and liked to eat. But the most important thing that research has shown, whether you do purees or baby led weaning or a mixture, there's a myth out there that says that if you mix baby led weaning and purees, kids can be confused and it's a, it's a safety hazard that is completely unsubstantiated. I don't, I, 
I talked to my friends who know about baby laid weaning and they're like, we don't have any idea where this idea came from. So um, as of today, I have no idea where that idea came from. And so I don't promote it. But there was some recent research that came out that compared like baby lid weaning and purees. And what they found is it wasn't really the foods that mattered as much as the parenting. Are you deciding where the food is served? Are you deciding what food is served? Are you allowing your child to decide whether they're going to eat and how much? Are you pressuring your child to eat? Are you playing that little airplane game where you're like, you know, and you get them to open your mouth so you could shove some food in there? If that's not helpful, um, doesn't mean you're a bad parent. If you use that, it just means that it's just not helpful. Um, and so, so all these things are really important. They're really, really important. And that's, those are the principles that I used weaning my kids. And then beyond that, the food, like you're going to take a mom, like so many moms have traumatic births, like breastfeeding did not go easily for me at all for the first kid. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It was painful for four months. I had postpartum anxiety that I did not understand. I had a baby who screamed bloody freaking murder in the car. And so you better believe I did not leave my house during my maternity leave because it was miserable. And so I didn't have any support. I couldn't find a lactation consultant that was covered by my insurance, you know, all this stuff. And now you're going to put this pressure on me to like make special baby food where I had to bake it, especially. I mean, I just couldn't. Yeah, no. Like, where's that energy going to come from? <laughs> Exactly. I was like, am I keeping this kid alive? Yeah. And that's really taking up all my energy. So <laughs> that's all you're going to get right now. <laughs> yeah. Really, for reals. So, yeah. So I, I, um, baby led weaning is great. It is not the only way and it is not the best way for all families. And you could be a great mom and feed your baby in the whatever you want weaning way. And that can include, but you know, what is important is that you follow those principles. And also just some really practical things. You got to let your baby get messy. Mm. If you're like, well, I want to do puree feeding because that would keep my baby's face clean. Then you really set up their sensory systems for some deficits. So they're not getting used to the texture that they need to in order to be able to eat more food. So maybe would you say like purees for the dinner when you're all, you know, going to be eating the same food, but maybe for lunch or for breakfast, they get to play with whatever you give them on their tray or something. Yeah. I mean, really, I feel like the first couple of years, you just got to resign yourself to the fact that it's going to be messy. And here's the thing. It ends. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It ends. My kids, my six-year-old now, rarely gets a lot of food on his face. Rarely. I mean, it's really rare. Yeah. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, he became a person. Like, he's <laughs> like, we did it. We suffered through the really big, messy phase yeah. and we put the plastic down on the floor. And it's, you know, that was life. And then, and here's the other thing if you're going to feed your kid healthy, their clothes are just going to be messy. And if you're the type of person who really cares about your kid's clothes, then you just have to kind of check in with yourself and say, is this something I'm going to lose sleep over for the next six years? Like mm-hmm. this can be a, this can be a hard thing for some parents. I am not big on housework because I've got different things to do with my life. I never use a stained <laughs> stick. I don't have time. Like it doesn't fit into my life. Right. So I just resigned myself to cheap hand-me-down clothes, clothes from a secondhand store and I don't care what happens to it. And you know what? There's plenty of other moms or me who are like, yeah, I'll take those stained clothes. Who cares? So (laughs) that's another way to deal with it. What are some of your favorite foods to introduce to infants? What you should start with? Yeah. So the World Health Organization recommends meats as the first food. And that's often surprising because people are like, what? (laughs) What about the rice cereal? There's a couple couple reasons. The main reason is that meat is a great source of iron and zinc. So whether you're doing baby led weaning, give them, giving them age appropriate strips of meat that they can kind of grab and suck the juices out of, or whether you're doing a meat puree, they're going to be getting iron and zinc from that naturally occurring iron and zinc. That doesn't mean if you're a vegetarian family and that, or a family where it just doesn't fit into your ethics, that doesn't mean you have to. The most, most, most important thing is that you're providing enough iron. And so if you're not doing, uh, you know, meat products, then you would want iron fortified products. And um, rather than going to rice cereal, which can have some contaminants in it, 
it doesn't mean they can never have it, but relying on that as the primary source of your iron isn't the best choice, but you could still do like an iron fortified oat cereal, a fortified barley cereal. You want to aim for the widest variety of foods that you can with your child. And you also want to make sure it has iron. And then you also want to make sure that there's plenty of vitamin A foods in, in your kid's diet. So that would be carrots, sweet potatoes. Um, a lot of dairy is fortified with vitamin A. And then again, meats like uh, salmon, liver even, although we don't really buy it, but that's a great source of vitamin A. All those things have vitamin A. And then also serving vitamin C foods for your child. And that's like a lot of different fruits and vegetables served in age appropriate ways, which would be something you could like squish between your finger so that they're not going to choke on it and or something pureed. So the vitamin C foods would be like strawberries, blueberries, and you want to make sure those are also, once they get old enough to pick it up with their finger, they can, they're cut in age appropriate forms so that they're not a choking hazard. Mm -hmm. That vitamin C helps your body absorb the iron more readily. Now they're still getting a lot of their nutrition from breast milk also potentially using formula as a supplement or, you know, that sort of thing. And so they're getting the bulk of their nutrition from that breast milk or formula, that stuff doesn't really have enough iron to meet their needs, especially breast milk. That's interesting because um, I had a question that came in that said, her son does not eat a lot of meat. Mm -hmm. I think she follows you. (laughs) So she probably knows that that's what you recommend. He doesn't like the texture. Mm -hmm. She thinks it's mostly chicken. So what are some other good fat protein sources? She says that she tries to give him whole milk, yogurt, and cheese and avocado, She and her husband are more plant-based, so she starts to get anxious that he's not getting enough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, all the plant-based sources of protein are great for kids, but you also need to make sure they're getting enough fat. And um, so that would mean, now let's say your child is just kind of picky and they've become a vegetarian on their own uh, and you're freaking out. Vegetarian children can be perfectly healthy and... Um, you just need to be more mindful specifically about the zinc and iron you may consider. Uh, if they're extremely picky and also vegetarian, you may consider a vitamin supplement for them for vegetarian kids. But really focusing on like the meats, the beans, peanut butter, tofu, uh, you know, soy, milk. You know, don't, don't go to like a nut-based milk, like an oat milk or an mm-hmm. almond milk or a I mean, oats are nuts, but any sort of those grain-based milks or nut-based milks are almost never appropriate for children. The one exception is pea milk and soy milk. Those have enough fat and protein for toddlers, but you really need to focus on working those vitamin C foods in at every meal and snack and making sure that you have a high iron food, which could be uh, spinach, it could be a bean, it could be the tofu, it could be a peanut butter, raisins, whatever those iron foods are, you got to pair them with a vitamin C food because plant-based iron is not absorbed very well by the body. But if you mix it with a vitamin C food, it increases the absorption by four to six times. You should look for a chart on that and Mm -hmm. see like a list of those foods together and how they would compare. That's interesting. Now I have to ask from the ignorant point of view that I have, you say, you know, oh, well, I make a meal for us, for our family for dinner, and we sit down and we have it, and then I would puree the food for my child, for my infant. Do you mean like, okay, you make chicken parm for the family, and then you like throw chicken parm in the puree for the baby? Sure. Yeah. Really? I mean, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here's here's what I would most likely do. Um, I would you know, make chicken parm for the family. And then if I had a child who wasn't really capable of chewing chicken yet, which is true of a baby, Mm -hmm. um, I might run it through the baby food grinder, which results in this chunky thing. I might grind the pasta differently. Now, babies can often learn to eat pasta depending on how it's prepared. And then, you know, I'd make sure there was some, so whatever on the side. I mean, I even, a couple of times I even put salad through the baby food grinder mm-hmm. or like, you know, chopped it up in the, in the um, food processor, put a little salad dressing. <laughs> yeah. Now in the beginning, am I right in understanding that you have to start with 
certain things or that you have to kind of do one thing at a time. Cause like, if you're going to puree a whole meal, that could be like tomato and cheese and meat and all those. Yeah. So for a long time, the prevailing thought with allergy prevention was introduce one food, wait three days, introduce another. That has been updated to introduce as many foods as you want. Hmm. Just wasn't that helpful. And what's more helpful is getting them more tastes of different foods in their first year. Well, yeah, because I mean, I can, I am actually, um, I'm not a baby, but <laughs> I am on a, a very regimented diet right now for, for health reasons. And I'm kind of on a reintroduction mm-hmm. phase as well. So I just added in nuts and now I've had nuts for about a week. And so I'm going to start adding in some grains and oats and right. just like a baby would. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but it does, it takes a long time. Yeah. And, and so, so what's more, factors. right. What's more important with babies is that you really just kind of introduce them to a lot of flavors and textures. And as soon as they are, here's another thing that I find people who do purees, they're like, cause I get people who are like, Oh, my 18 month old is eating purees. When should I switch them to table food? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. let's back up. So Purees are like a few months, unless you have a child who has a delay, like an oral motor delay where they're not learning to chew. If you notice your child not being able to chew, not putting things in their mouth, not putting toys in their mouth, not doing any of that, that's a big red flag. And I always recommend seeking out an evaluation from an occupational therapist at that point. Even if you notice in your baby who's nine months old, because the earlier you get in on that, yeah. like the, the earlier you can get them on the back on the right track. So, but otherwise you've got a couple months of purees max. Otherwise you got to so be. Like what, what age range are you saying? Okay. So let's say you, you think of yourself as a person who's doing purees. I would rather you think of yourself as a person who's going to use purees as part of the process of getting your child to table food. Mm-hmm. So purees are maybe you want to start with purees at six months old and then, but you already, by the time they're seven months old, eight months old, need to be thinking about chunkier, chunkier food, seeing how your child interacts, always pushing their limit. Like, can they, can they eat a bite of banana now at eight months old or seven months old? I mean, my kids, again, were just so into feeding themselves and it was, you know, they progress themselves pretty easily. And I didn't have to think about it that much, but you as the parent really need to be pushing them because as soon as they're eating table food, your job just got dramatically easier. Right. You can make one meal for the whole family. And I had my eye on that prize. And so even if you're like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, my kid is learning, they need to learn to chew. They need to learn to eat. So you need to be teaching them to do all those foods. So if you're going to move them through kind of the, um, stereotypical phase where you're like, okay, I'm going to do purees and then I'm going to do thick purees and then I'm going to do lumpy purees and then I'm going to do, you know, soft foods, whatever, however you want to do it. I don't really care as long as you're moving them towards table food as quickly as you can. And also think about it. Like if you're going to do baked sweet potatoes as part of your dinner, give it to the baby, like easy, easy, easy. And also learning to cook your own meals for the family and kind of like a softer, easier way for babies to eat makes everybody's life easier in terms of like cooking. But when you're sitting there at the table and your baby is there and your baby, your sweet, wonderful baby is learning to throw and they pick up the broccoli and they throw it in your face and then they smear it all over their face and then they spit it out in your face. It's just like, and then they're screaming, they're screaming because they want to get down because they just learned how to crawl. All of a sudden it's way more complicated than you ever imagined. And then you're like, wait, but am I allowed to feed them this? Or if you're doing baby led weaning, there's a lot of rules. So you're not allowed to do this and you're not not allowed to ever spoon feed them. And you're like, (laughs) it's really overwhelming if you're struggling with that. Now, some, some moms just love it and that's great. Um, I couldn't manage that. And so uh, I think I I had a little bit of a head start in just kind of parental feeding practices, and so I managed okay. But for a lot of families where they don't have that background and they're not exactly sure what to say and what do you do when your baby spits the food out? Are they going to starve? There's a lot of these fears that creep in and really make it more complicated. And what is some advice that you have when people do experience that, when they do start refusing the food? Say you're not like the mom that I met who 
gave 20 options. Maybe you're the mom who gave three or four or two or three. And now they, like you said, you know, I haven't even thought of it that way, but they just learned how to crawl. They want to do that instead. That's way more fun than being, you know, locked into a chair. So would you just say, Oh, looks like they're not ready to eat right now. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I mean, it's important to establish a meal and snack structure from as soon as they start eating. So as soon as they start eating, you know, they start with one meal and it's kind of like cool and you know, whatever. And, but you can use that and you know, they're still relying primarily on their liquid nutrition. As you go, you're going to start adding meals and snacks. And so by the time they're weaned, you want them on a schedule and they don't get to choose when they eat. You get to choose when they eat. Mm -hmm. And if they, you know, they need to sit in the chair for a short amount of time. And I recommend starting with one to two minutes per year of age. So that's like one minute for a one-year-old. And the reason I know that's appropriate is because I have a, an extremely active, energetic set of children. (laughs) (laughs) And so I'm a realist when it comes to this. Like, did you get your walking one-year-old, your running one-year-old to sit for a minute? Good job. Yeah. So after you start with that, you can increase the amount of time that they're willing to sit. So you can use a timer, you can use a sound timer and get them to sit for one minute. When it dings, they can get down, but you need to help them sit for that amount of time. It's not an option. This is like, this is you becoming a parent. So when you have a baby, it's very easy to be just like this loving, nurturing ball of wonderful motherness, right? (laughs) And your child, it's not that hard to parent a, a baby because right. it's more just like, did I feed them? Did I change them? Did they play? Yeah. Am I reading? You know, things like that. One, things start to change, right? Yeah. You're like, oh, their personality, maybe 18, comes, out. <laughs> their personality comes out, 18 months all maybe they start their terrible twos early. Mm. Um, maybe they're just, they start to have opinions. They start to assert their independence and all of a sudden, you as a parent are like, huh, I gotta, I think I need some strategies here. Yeah. (laughs) And that's, that's another part is like, we go from, from as infants, we're taught that kids need to be fed on demand. Babies need to be fed on demand because that is the best practice and has been shown to have great health outcomes. Problem is that's not true of food and nobody seems to be telling moms that. You mean beforehand you're talking about breast milk or formula? Yeah, breast milk or formula. Like around around six months, like most moms have found like a a rhythm of how they're feeding their child. It's quote on demand at six months looks a lot different than on demand at two weeks old. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you know, there's general times that babies eat, right? And yeah, you might nurse them at a different time for some other reason. But in general, they're not just eating for comfort. They're not eating for these things. They're eating because this is their body learning how to exist in the in the world. Now, when you introduce food, food is not an on-demand thing. Yeah. It's like solid food. Food is not on demand. Food is on a schedule. And your baby isn't allowed to choose when they get to eat. That's your job as a parent to make that schedule. And this is how we teach kids how to listen to their bodies, how to know when they're hungry and full, how to eat nutritiously, how to be hungry for meals so that they will eat the nutritious food that you make. And it's so important. And I've gotten a lot of pushback on that um, from people who are like, oh, but my my child is hungry. And I'm like, no, your child just ate an hour yeah. ago. They're going to be okay. It, it's really okay. It's okay to experience the feeling of hunger Because how else would you know what that is? It's really important. So you have to like, from the time they start eating, this is snack time, this is lunch time, you know, every two to three hours for little kids, it's perfectly fine. And, and they just get weaned right onto a meal and snack schedule and you maintain, that's your parenting. That's like you starting your parenting skills of like, because believe me, as soon as your kid learns how to talk, they're going to be like, mom, I want cookies. Right. <laughs> and you're like, it's not snack time. Take control and also, you can. that's not on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it will be on the menu, but not today. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Okay. I want to talk negotiating with food. I am so okay. curious about your opinion about negotiating with food. 
So I was dealing with my family as well when I was babysitting and they had, the child wasn't eating. So they decided to come up with this negotiation and they would get X, Y, Z. And if they finished this, they finished that. However, it drove me bonkers because they would not follow through with their negotiation. Oh gosh. (laughs) So that clearly, you know, that's a parenting conference. That's like a, you know, how to parent podcast, but this is more about negotiation with food. Do you recommend it? Do you think it's helpful? No. So um, using food as a negotiation tool is fraught with challenges uh, and it's going to have unintended consequences. So this family, if they say, well, if you eat this, I'm going to give you, if you eat this chicken, I'm going to give you your strawberries. What they're telling their child is that strawberries are better than chicken. Right. The more they say that and the more they hold out for those strawberries and the bigger those strawberries become and more wonderful and more delicious, anytime that that child is now presented with the opportunity of strawberries versus chicken, they're not going to eat that chicken no. ever. They're just going to eat strawberries right. because they're wonderful. Right. Now, if you reverse that and you go back to this idea that like kids need to be able to choose what, whether, whether they eat and how much it's not our job to force them to eat. You put the strawberries on the chicken on the plate, and then you don't talk to them about it. You talk about their day, you tell funny jokes, and it's 100% their job to decide whether to eat, what they're going to eat, what they're going to eat from what you've put on their plate or what that's on their tray or, or what's on the table. And you leave it at that. That's your job. Your job is to put it on the table not to make them eat it. That's their job. Now, there's one exception. That one exception is if your kid has an eating disorder called avoidant restrictive feeding intake disorder, ARFID. That is a a newer eating disorder that has been identified. There are some select cases where a therapist, as part of therapy, so under medical supervision, under psychiatric supervision, your child may be given rewards for eating a certain amount of food. That's the only exception. Mm -hmm. That's the only exception. And that's because the child is not eating enough to stay alive. They're, they're literally starving. And so they're working on a new psychology so that the child can learn to support their body. But otherwise negotiating is not going to give you the results. It is, it helps kids become more picky. It will make picky kids eat less. Um, it makes dessert more exciting. Yeah. It makes eating less exciting. It feels right to many parents, but it almost always in every scenario will backfire on you. This is um, so, so random, but I have a little phrase that my grandfather used to say that my mom told me my grandfather used to say, which was like it or lump it. <laughs> And it was like, you have it if you want it. Otherwise, that's that's it. There's nothing else that you're going to yeah. get. Yeah, there's nothing else. And it's okay if kids decide not to eat because guess what? Especially if they're young, they got another meal or snack coming two or three hours later. And that's okay for them to wait. It's so interesting what you said about commenting on foods. I had a mom that wrote to me saying that she is kind of always under this constant threat of anxiety, making sure that her son eats enough. She says, I try not to convey that to him though. Um, She doesn't make comments on how much he eats. She doesn't bargain with him like we're talking about with his food. She lets him eat what he wants. She gives him maybe a second or third helping and then moves on. She doesn't even like to comment on whether he likes something. Oh, do you like that? You don't like that? Um, Is that kind of the best approach that you think? And they just- Yeah, she's doing great. Yeah. She's doing great. I have no, okay, good. I have no critiques. So now I, I'm just finding this so fascinating. I'm going to try to speed up some of my questions so I can get you out of here, but this is just amazing. Okay. I want to hear, I saw on your Instagram posts, but I want to hear about real easy weekdays. What is this? Sure. So real easy weekdays is a meal plan for busy families, like real busy families who really don't like cooking, yeah. but no, they need to do it. <laughs> And they want to make sure those orange veggies are on the table, but they don't want to have to think about it. They just want somebody else to give them a suggestion for where that could fit in. That's what Real Easy Weekdays is. It's based on the idea of repeated exposure for a food, of 
pretty simple meals, some convenience foods included. So if you're the type of person who will only eat unprocessed foods, it's not for you. But most of us are like working or doing a million things or got a kind of ton of kids around. We don't like cooking. <laughs> I also don't like cooking. So this is, this is the meal plan that I created for myself. And then I was like, I can't be the only person <laughs> struggling exactly. with this. And I kind of threw it out there at Instagram. I was like, would you be interested? And people were like, yes. Um, <laughs> so that's what it is. It teaches you to make a, a set of meals that you can rotate through on a regular basis so that you get fast at them. And all, but you know what? It also includes like some homemade snacks. So if you want to once a week, bake a batch of muffins. You can feel good about it. They've got some veggies in them and you can have a freezer stash and it's how to build a freezer stash, but with only making these once a week, you know, like, so you could do that on the weekend. So it includes a little bit of food prep, not a ton, but many of the recipes you could food prep for if that's your thing. And it's just really, really practical. It's also on sale right now. Ooh, where yeah. can people find that? Um, really the weekdays it's available at kids eat and color.com. It's also available at, uh, kids eat and color. Let's see, I guess officially it's kids eat and slash meal system. Okay. Uh, but you can also just find it on the website there. So yeah, it's easy. And you know, it also includes an allergy supplement. So if your family has allergies, there's a top eight free gluten-free dairy-free, um, Great. supplement that goes along with it. That is not quite as easy because you can't use convenience foods, but it is safe. Well, I'll put all of those links in the show notes so people have them. With easy cooking and meal planning, I feel like parents always turn to carbs, you know, the mac and cheese, yeah. the quesadillas. The, They're delicious. Of course. Why is that? <laughs> and is there a way to like shift our focus and not, you know, not think easy and think mac and cheese? Sure. So um, there's no mac and cheese in my, my meal plan. <laughs> No, I'm not it's saying all mac very and cheese easy. is bad. I love mac and cheese. <laughs> of course, <but. laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like kids, kids, there's an there's an idea that kids need kid food. And that's an idea that the mar the food marketing um sector has put upon us so that we will buy special food for our kids. Yeah. The reality is food is food. People eat food. Kids are people. People can eat whatever's on the table. And that's true of your kids too. You may need to chop it up small or you may need to prepare it in a way that they like it. But of course, kids are going to love carb. Like, and when we say carbs, often people ref are referring to like processed carbohydrates. Right. So like your crackers and your cookies and your, your uh, you know, mac and cheese. Um, it's not bad for kids, but kids absolutely need carbohydrates. They need them to grow. Kids need tons of energy because even though they're only growing a couple inches a year, that's a lot of energy. So we need to make sure that we're not falling prey to the idea that carbohydrates are bad, that energy is bad, that calories are bad, or that kids don't need any of those things. They absolutely do. But I think we could just focus in, in thinking that like spaghetti squash is a carb and sweet potatoes is a carb. Yeah, absolutely. Now, frankly, spaghetti squash is not my jam, and I would much rather serve my kids <laughs> pasta. But, uh, but yeah, absolutely. All the potato, all the oh, yeah. yeah, all the potatoes, all the um, all the squash. Uh, you know the the breads, the grains, the like oatmeal. Kids love oatmeal. Not all kids, yeah. but like many kids can learn to like oatmeal. Many kids can learn to like rice and um. Uh, quinoa, you know, my kids are huge quinoa fans, probably because I don't give them a choice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We eat tons of quinoa. Um, so yeah, there's, there's so many options like kids, the, the greater the number of foods that we have for our kids, the more competent they become at eating a variety of foods, which is the best thing we do, can do for our health. How do you know when you're making a plate, what your portions should be? How much, I mean, small, I start yeah. small. So the kid is going to decide how big their portions are going to be. And if you got a toddler, they might eat all strawberries for your for one meal. And that's okay. Because guess what? They're not going to eat all strawberries for every meal for a week. Exactly. And you as the parent should use some common sense and be like, if they ate a whole plate of strawberries today, I don't have to serve strawberries at all for the rest of the day. That's so smart to remember that you kind of let yourself off the hook a little bit in that. Yeah. Yeah. It's their job to decide whether to eat and how much. That's not your job. Your job is to decide what to make available at a plate. Now I recommend like parents are like, oh my gosh, like what about the food waste? Food waste is primarily caused by parents using too big portions. 
Like if you get a one-year-old, we're talking like one tablespoon of food per food, Mm. one tablespoon. Wow. That's it. Like put that on the plate, see what they eat. When they ask for more, give them more as many times as they want and leave it at that. Like, you know, wasting a tablespoon of peas is a lot less painful than wasting a half a cup of peas because you had it in your mind that you wanted your kid to eat a half a cup of peas. Yeah, absolutely. And if you know your kid doesn't like it, one one half size of your pinky finger is fine for an exposure. What I really want you as the mom to know is that your worth as a mother is not dependent on what your child eats. Mm -hmm. You win when you put the food on their plate or on the table. What they eat is their win. It's not your win. So you're doing a good job. If you're putting food on the table, you're doing a good job. And if you have struggles, that's fine. Come and read my blog. Come and visit my Instagram page or Pinterest or, you know, whatever. Like, look for help on on those little sticky spots. But just remember, you're doing a much better job than you think you are. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of my mom used to tell me when I was a kid, I would hold my breath when I was having a tantrum. And I guess my Mm. grandparents would freak out and say, Jessica's not breathing. She's not breathing. Like, you got to make her breathe. And my mom would just calmly say, she'll breathe when she needs to breathe. (laughs) like she's she's not going to kill herself she'll breathe eventually this is just her tactic you know so it's that kind of thing too I think with food it's like they'll eat when they need to eat you allow that set time for food and snack time for for meal and snack time you put on the plate what the options are and then if they eat all the strawberries and that's it great if they if they don't eat anything and they sat for a minute or two minutes, according to their age, then they get up and they play, they're going to be hungry, eat later, and they'll eat at the next mealtime. I think that's really just a weight off of mom's shoulders. Right. And you know what? Some moms are going to, they're going to be doing this and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, it's not working. Things are getting worse. They're getting worse and worse. And my child is eating less and less and less foods. That's the time to reach out for help. Because there are kids who are really going to struggle and it's not your fault. It's something in the child that is making it difficult for them to eat, whether it's fear or a sensory challenge or something like a disorder like like ARFID. And that's when you need to reach out for help. Um, I do have a program for a therapeutic program for families of picky eaters, because for some families, they're going to be like, I'm doing all the right things and it's not working. Mm -hmm. And for those families, they're going to need more training. So I always like to remind parents that like, it sounds simple and it's going to work for some families, but for other families, they're dealing with challenges that they really can't handle on their own and they do need additional support. So if you've got this gut feeling that something is actually wrong, go with that gut feeling, find a resource, whether it's mine or whether it's talking to your pediatrician or finding an occupational therapist, listen to your gut in those things. Okay. My very last question. We didn't talk much about your boys, but I always have to ask this question of my guests. So what is something that you want to tell your two little boys now for when they are 18? Oh my gosh. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I want to tell them. And it doesn't have to be food oriented. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Well, I, you know, it wouldn't be, that's the thing. That's the thing. I would want to tell them um, gosh, it's a good question. You know, food is not the most important thing. Like when it comes down to these things, you're like, no, yeah. I want to tell them that I believe they, that I believe in them and their ability to be a loving presence in the world. Mm. If you enjoyed the show today, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and leave a review on Apple podcasts. So I know how to better serve you. I'd also love for you to join our community of Mamas in Training on Facebook. You can find me at Mamas in Training on Instagram and at mamasintraining.com. For Mamas in Training, I'm Jessica Lorian. We're in this together.